The story of Bungie begins deep in the Swedish countryside, in the tiny fishing village of Askersund, where the farmers would gather each- Askersund? I'll put my boot in your Askersund. Now listen up, Bungie starts here. Sweet Home Chicago, 1991. That year I was taking an artificial intelligence class, and Jason was in that class. I was working on a game, and Alex was trying to start a company. Where Jason is actually a lot like a shipboard AI, where most of the time it does miraculous work that nobody else could do, and then the other times it's, you know, crazy. This is what I think of the Computer Game Developers Conference. <laughs> you know, we just got to talking and uh, thought maybe we should try partnering up. And I finished that first game for the company that became Bungie. Two guys come up with a manifesto. Seven steps to world domination. Seven steps to world domination. Because that's the best number. It's like rock. Nothing beats rock or seven. Bungie Studios started properly in 1991. First Bungie game I ever heard of was Marathon. Let's just say that it's a grand galactic space opera with mystical overtones. How close is Marathon at this point? Well, uh, we ship by... August Mac World 97. <laughs> we'll all be really happy. I think at that time, honestly, Mac owners would have been excited by Space Invaders in a tube. One of the first games I ever played where I really got a sense of a community around an actual game was Myth. The ability to play multiplayer against strangers and friends has been a foundation for other things that we've gone on to do really well. Yeah, nothing says killer, hardcore, rough and tumble like Halo. Paul Russell is the father of Halo. <laughs> I came up with, uh, with the name Halo, and it was not received well. Jason was leaning more towards Redshift. Covenant was one of them. I thought it sounded like a, like a bad 80s hair band. You know, Covenant. Halo is an epic journey to save humanity from terrible menace. That's all it is. That's good. They should put that on the box. I remember seeing just a single texture on a wall with a flashlight going, wow, this is gonna be awesome. And it was way before the Xbox even looked like the Xbox and way before Halo even looked like Halo. That's the first version of uh, the Warthog, I guess, huh? Yeah. Man, this isn't Halo, dude. Man, this is really, really old. <laughs> we had a huge map for a continuous RPG game and for that we like had an RTS and then it, next thing you know it was a third person and we were playing it in our office. Yeah, Halo depended on a lot of that early wandering. We were expecting a final sales number to be 700,000 units and then it just went through the roof. Why? Because of my pretty pretty face. Hoorah! Step 4 didn't really go very well. Which one was Step 4? Which one's Step 4? Do you know what Step 4 is? Right, we gotta get a picture of the uh, bungee food. I know back in the day in Chicago, there was a very infamous Chinese food we, the restaurant we used to order from. They used to just deliver us crazy amounts of Chinese food all the time. <laughs> What's this crap? I don't think that really accelerated the process development uh, development so much as it sort of filled it with a lot of bathroom breaks. Because Halo 1 happened really big, I don't think there's any doubt that there wasn't gonna be a Halo 2. We're like, well, we should do another one, you know, because we're out of margaritas and, you know, expensive, I'm gonna need more. But you can't stick it. You're on. Halo 2 led us to step five of our plan for world domination. We were supposed to get the orbital defense station. Uh, that was step five. I forget step five. But Microsoft said that if they're going to build an orbital space station, that it's going to be running Windows, and we didn't want to be going up there. Oh, it's been recovered. We're trying to move on to giving it away. Ling Ling is a severed dog's head. <laughs> in a jar. <laughs> of all the Chicago traditions we should have left behind. Other people just run away our barf. But Ling Ling's head, if you have faith, it's gonna help us dominate. If you wanna dominate, <laughs> try this puppy. There were a lot of reasons that it was important for us to move to another building. One is that 
Bungie is all about having its own identity. A lot of people just felt like we were just part of the Borg. Being in this sort of stale uh, cube farm type environment isn't very conducive to being creative. I think the main reason we moved is we just got bigger. Apparently we've got 200 people in the building now. I mean, we're just, we're huge. The new place is a lot more like, I think my, when my dad came visit, he was like, oh my God, this place looks like the set of 24 or something. It's like a fortress of solitude right next to a Starbucks. The day of Bungie starts with the uh, obligatory run through security. And you have like three seconds to get to the door and actually open it before it relocks. Uh, the warehouse. Over there's the uh, multiplayer engineering pod. Where our uh, genius, wildly talented programmers sit and uh, make problems for artists typically. Maybe not Luke Timmons. The way that the engineers and the artists work together is one of my favorite things about Bungie. You've got these insanely brilliant mathematical types uh, that are really passionate about this new technology. There have been a lot of ideas that have started from the engineering side. If water looks like water and rocks look like rocks and explosions look like explosions, then you are engaged in the plot on a much more visceral level. You see water shows up in every level. So basically means if you have something cool, they'll actually go out of their ways, making sure that the technology gets used in the right way. So we're more of a partnership than, than a competition. All along the far back wall, we have environment art. Hey Marcus, how would you describe this pod? This particular pod? <laughs> Command Central. Every piece of artwork that you see in the game is built by a community of artists. The dirt on the tires gets there because someone has to put it there. The scratch on the inner side of the fender because a rock might have jumped up and hit it. Everything that moves in our game, the wheel on the warthog rotating, the little antenna bouncing up and down like that, the shotgun spitting out a cartridge. They flush out the world, make it feel a lot more real. Every now and then, it'll catch my eye still. Wow, I can't believe we were able to pull that off. The acoustics are fantastic in here. But I could hear uh, somebody in test fart, and uh, they're all the way on the other side of the building. The key to Bungie's success is not some sort of magic. It's testers that keep the build stable to make sure that everything is as fun as it could be. We required the testers to shoot everything, run through everything, jump 15,000 times in the same place to see if it'll break the game. The way Bungie tests involves everyone. The artist is testing by running the game and adding new textures to it. Designers testing the game by adding a new vehicle or tweaking the rate. Marty, C. Paul, and Jay are testing the game by tweaking audio. It's people sitting at their desk doing work testing our game. The important thing about interactive music is that it, it feels like it's scoring what you're doing, and the, this will all eventually correspond to something significant that's happening in the game. Everything that you hear or see is created by someone. Everything is designed very intentionally. If you trick all your senses enough, you're really immersed into it. Then you're not just playing a game, you're playing an experience. I just start listening, like a chef cooking in a kitchen. You have all these ingredients, you start throwing some stuff in, and you say, ah, maybe this spice will be good. There's the design pod with all the guys working on the single player missions. The design pit. It's really uh, meaningless without these guys. <laughs> Art and design is like almost the exact opposite of each other. I'm always trying to add something that he wants to get rid of, or he's trying to add something that I want to get rid of. We'll give him a beautiful environment, perfectly composed, lit, and then he goes, I'm just gonna put a few crates. Don't worry, just a few. <laughs> then you got purple crates, and you got the green crates. And, and then there's, oh, don't worry. These crates are only here temporarily. You're gonna turn them into something really cool, and then you find out, so long as it stays exactly the same proportions as a crate. Tell them to drop everything and yeah. recraft this. What I try to do at work is just whatever I enjoy, and hopefully that falls in line with what we do with Bungie, and when it does, I'm really happy, and when it doesn't, I get sad. I think everybody wants to work in a place where they enjoy coming to work and they do things that are, yeah, that are cool. everybody's intentions of being at Bungie. You know, like, everybody here wants to make cool games, do cool stuff, not so much for 
everybody else is out there is because we want to create cool shit. I'm actively working on number seven every day, and laying out my schemes, my plans. I'm trying to recreate some of that wandering we did at the beginning of Halo 1 and we did at the beginning of Pathways. Keeping everyone super motivated, hoping that we're going to create something beautiful. On that final day, when our enemies find themselves all standing together on a giant cargo net, on a highly sprung giant mechanism waiting to be hurled into the sun, they will look to themselves and say, this agenda has been posted publicly on Bungie Net for seven years, and we paid no attention. If only we'd look. Ha! Talk to me after the next trilogy. I'm gonna be in there, right? <laughs> <laughs>